Okay, so again, thank you very much and welcome to this webinar. Um, I'll let open it about the key skills talent will need to develop in a hyper-connected world. So this webinar is uh, hosted by OPIT with the presence of Professor Alan Lerner. Uh, Alan is a professor at uh, Universidad de Buenos Aires, professor at the Universidad de San Andres, and former director of management consulting at K KPMG, and is professor at OPIT. So welcome, Alan, and thank you. Um, just before we start, I'm going to give a few words about uh, OPIT, who we are, and our degrees, and then after Alan's uh, webinar, um, I will continue to give you some insights about our programs and admissions process. So, first of all, OPIT is an um, Open Institute of Technology, is a higher uh, education institution whose mission is to unlock progress and employment on a global scale. So, we want to provide um, high quality, top quality, and affordable education in the field of technology. So what actually sets us apart is the fact that we are um, an institution that is fully recognized and accredited at the European level and beyond, also by West in the States and Canada. Our programs are flexible and fully online. They are focused on technology, so we have bachelor and master degrees in um, data science, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, um, digital business, and so on and so forth. So the focus of, is on technology as it is important today. That's why our programs are career aligned, aligned with what companies need, management needs, and what like people would need to develop in order to continue to um, climb the ladder of their career. Um, despite being fully online and flexible, the support is always there and available. You have the presence of tutors, professors, coordinators, career service coaches, that will support you along the way. And finally, we deem to be inclusive and affordable. One of the most important characteristics is the fact that we are um, very keen in checking that our professors are of the best professors that you can have. And so Alan is going to be one of them presenting today. Um, our rector has been former Minister of Education in Italy, Professor Profumo, and also rector at uh, Politecnico di Torino. We have professors coming from different universities, but also companies, though they have both the professionalism coming from an experience in a company and also the uh, academic proficiency in how to teach uh, to students. So we have uh, professors coming from companies such as Amazon, uh, uh, Microsoft, Morgan Stanley, and so on and so forth. But without any further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Professor Alan Lerner to understand better about thriving in the hyper-connected world. Thank you so much, Greta, uh, and welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. I'm really happy to be here and uh, to share some perspectives and insights uh, around this uh, amazing topic. Uh, I'm gonna be sharing my, my screen for a bit. Let me know if you can see it. There we go. Yes. Awesome. So thriving in the hyper-connected world, new skills, you'll need to grow your career. And when we think about new skills, I, I would like to correct that because some of the skills are actually not new, but are critical in times like these. So to start us off, I want to share some insights on Charles Schwab. Uh, he uh, is a, an amazing thought leader when it comes to management and of course uh what are the skills and the traits that professionals should be developing and i want to rescue this quote because i think that it speaks a lot about uh some key trait that is critical for us to thrive he says good morning remember a person can succeed at almost anything for which they have unlimited enthusiasm and uh, at some point one of the key lessons that i've learned uh, doing a lot of management consulting is that enthusiasm, passion for what you do, and uh, having the uh, ability uh, to always persevere would definitely give you 40-50% of the end result. After that, of course, there are a lot of other factors that deal with the technical components, uh, business understanding components, and of course, there's a small luck component that should be considered. But again, this has been pivotal to my career, and uh, that's why I'm, I'm really happy to share this with you. So 
Uh, our agenda for today, uh, I want to address three things. The first one, I want to give some context and share some data about where are we standing in terms of our business context from a global perspective. Uh, then I, I'd like to share some uh, deep dive on key skills uh, that, in my opinion and from my experience, are pivotal to grow your career. And it doesn't matter if you work for a specific industry, if you do uh, independent consulting, if you own a small and medium business, or if you work for a corporation. These are things that uh, I strongly believe that will uh, enhance your acumen. And then share some final thoughts and information. So. Uh, to start us off, um, some ideas that matter. Uh, there's a lot of interesting professional literature going around what's going on uh, in regards to uh, how are companies reshaping their future and what's the role of individuals uh, in this uh, never ending process. So uh, taking some uh, insights from different reports that are quite current, um, People should definitely remain not only at the center of the progress, but at the center of the stage when it comes to uh, developing and executing outstanding results. And this speaks a lot about the importance of disruptive technology as a critical companion, as a critical complement, and not necessarily the substitute of human beings. So enter AI, enter generative AI, enter any disruptive technology that can help and complement the work that we do as professionals. So the risk with AI uh, is that it's not an equalizer, but it brings a bigger divide if people aren't ready. And this is quite true, considering the fact that a lot of people are quite frightened about the use of technology or how can technology replace them in roles that might not be critical. Uh, my takeaway from, from this is that uh, we really need to think about this as an opportunity not only to thrive, but to be more efficient and to add additional uh, and greater value to our clients and to our uh, organization. So again, we need to be able to handle this risk and treat this as an opportunity. Uh, this was quite spoken at Davos 2024. And again, it comes to us when we think about the responsible use that we should have when um, executing projects, leveraging on AI, on artificial intelligence. And uh, maybe taking another uh, approach to this, but quite aligned with what I've said, uh, CEOs are more likely to uh, actually uh, anticipate the importance of technological change and how are we incorporating the use of disruptive technology to our work. So again, we need to focus not only in using the technology, but also acknowledging their importance and how are they going to help us uh, achieve our organizational and individual goals. So again, leaders should empower people to use technology and to help themselves learning and being trained on these technologies, but a thorough communication and a lot of change management should also be done to make sure that messages are uh, clear in the fact that we need technology, but our artisanal uh, work, our knowledge will be key in making sure that we uh, provide additional value and that we can differentiate from our competitors. So the World Economic Forum uh, is actually quite instrumental uh, around the importance of the use of technology and how this will boost productivity. And of course, the risks around the use of this technology. Uh, so we all know that uh, the fourth industrial revolution will bring more digital jobs that can actually leverage the use of a remote workforce. Uh, this will also create a lot of new jobs, but might potentially destroy others, especially around activities that can be replaced by AI or even robotics process automation or RPA. So we need to really take care uh, about that and always try to upskill and reskill ourselves. Um, office environments uh, will also change and COVID has shown that that's a real thing. Even now, companies are asking their employees to uh, come back to the office even two or three times a week, which is also a, a cool discussion about what the future of work will bring. Uh, of course, some skills uh, around uh, data, uh, around the use of disruptive technology, about uh, storytelling and efficient uh, soft traits uh, that we're going to be discussing will be definitely key. And of course, addressing, uh, di uh, addressing the importance of 
diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, making sure that uh, everyone is considered as part of a, a pivotal workforce. So again, when we think of uh, what is going on, Accenture brings a, a really great perspective, uh, which is in line with what I've said. Uh, we really need to reshape the relationship that we have with technology, trying to leverage the use of uh, disruptive tech, generally speaking, and make sure that we deliver and we use a data-centric approach. We need to really take a lot of care and understand how data can help us thrive and make solid decisions. Uh, we need to, of course, leverage uh, in uh, robots or in trained software, AI, so we can also uh, develop and be more efficient and productive. So again, the human-centered approach, leveraging technology is key. Uh, of course, we need to continue uh, developing knowledge about uh, how uh, different applications, different business uh, developments and ventures can actually help us uh, in this sense. And of course, understand that uh, humans and machines are more related than we expect. And at some point, uh, taking a human center approach, we will uh, all be uh, living together with uh, this technology to make sure that we can actually uh, deliver in a consistent way. So at some point when we think about Gartner uh, future of work trends, uh, all of these points are addressed, uh, even more around the fact that uh, you know, uh, work-life balance is even more pivotal nowadays. Some organizations are thinking about a four-day uh, work week, uh, and of course that technology can leverage that and help them streamline their efforts. Uh, again, AI as a way of making and uh, alleviating people's burdens with transactional activities, uh, careers uh, that are going to be uh, boosted by new roles that will appear. And of course, the importance of uh, understanding and uh, dealing with non-controllable barriers such as climate change. Um, of course, this would then uh, allow different organizations to uh, choose how do they wanna attract and retain their talent? And of course, how do their uh, C-level suite or even middle managers wanna develop uh, better ways to um, transmit their value proposition and, of course, work very closely with their talent to develop uh, new career paths. So when we think about uh, the impact that uh, COVID had a while ago, when we are still uh, at some point thinking about it, and when we compare and contrast the uh, willingness for people to go to office or to what extent are we really thinking about a completely remote workforce? Uh, this KPMG study uh, that actually interviewed more than uh, 1,300 uh, CEOs from different industries all around the world uh, is actually proving that uh, the uh, return to the office is quite critical. And uh, at some point they're using that, uh, saying that 90% of the uh, C-level uh, executives that were interviewed say that they will likely reward employees who make an effort to come into the office, not only with better projects, but with raises or promotions. This is quite uh, an interesting discussion point, especially because we are here trying to understand uh, what people need in terms of skills to thrive. And uh, being able to manage uh, remote work and uh, adding value, no matter if you're on site in the office or at your place uh, is quite critical. So again, 62% of the uh, uh, C-level uh, executives that were interviewed think that backing office will be a reality compared to 34% in 2022. And again, they really identify the, the employee value proposition as critical to retain talent. But what are the benefits or what are the uh, components that will actually allow them to offer something differentiated? Uh, so 83% of the CEOs actually state that their organization's success uh, depends on having a strong ethical culture and uh, being able to uh, gather with people, to share projects, to share perspectives on site is something that uh, is quite there. And uh, of course, on site presence uh, for a lot of uh, the interviewed CEOs allows for more collaboration. And uh, at some point, that uh, 
is seen as a greater enabler for success. Not sure if this is uh, a certain truth. What I know is that there is a lot of discussion around it and that we need to learn how to uh, live with it, uh, making uh, our best effort uh, to work in this uh, hybrid uh, fashion. And again, uh, it's up to the organizations and the different industries to set up policies that uh, can actually make people thrive, no matter if they're remote, hybrid, or uh, fully on-site. So I really invite you to read this report and all of the materials that I uh, shared, because again, there's a lot of uh, stuff there. And of course, uh, we live in a hyper-connected world, and uh, this image speaks about that. Uh, when we think about the amount of uh, data, information, knowledge that is created in 60 seconds, and we see how uh, high-tech, uh, companies are taking advantage of it, it's amazing to understand the potential that this can bring. So again, uh, welcome to the uh, fourth industrial revolution. Welcome to the experience economy. Welcome to uh, the importance of human-centered design and of course of uh, developing a data-driven mindset. So let's start uh, discussing some of the key capabilities that uh, we uh, want to continue developing. The first one speaks about managing complexity. This speaks about having the ability to solve problems and make decisions under uh, ever-changing uh, conditions and of course in fast-paced environments. My recommendations around this are uh, pretty much uh, dealing with the importance of understanding the notion that organizations are complex social technical systems where a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different people, a lot of different uh, individuals with uh, different skills and experience uh, work. And uh, we need to acknowledge that, uh, especially when we think about knowledge as a service, in a consulting uh, industry or in a uh, SMB or corporation, we really need to start developing uh, and adopting an outside-in vision instead of uh, developing an inside-out perspective. So what's the best way to thrive? What's the best way to improve? What's the best way to realize how can we be better professionals? See what other organizations, what other professionals, what other people is doing, not with the intention of copying it. Copying it is a mistake, but we can emulate. We can identify best practices and we can adapt them to our profile, to our organization. So that's key. Also diversity when building high-performing teams is critical, especially to solve problems that deal with different notions and different nuances that deal with data processes, technology, strategy. Uh, how can we develop uh, better go-to-market strategies? So this speaks a lot about uh, moving fast and fixing things even faster. And uh, again, at some point, avoid paralysis analysis uh, just because if you're not uh, in charge or if you're not going to be the protagonist, someone else will. And uh, that will definitely uh, won't be helpful, especially if you're dealing uh, with not only high tech environments, but also with uh, interesting and uh, good opportunities to develop new businesses. Uh, again, that mesh people, processes, technology with data all around. And finally, in terms of managing complexity, it's critical that uh, everyone, no matter if we have technical experience or, or management experience, or if we're like a mesh, embrace and develop digital literacy, uh, adopting a proactive approach towards brittle, anxious, nonlinear, and incomprehensible or banny environments. And this speaks a lot about the importance of getting closer to data. And uh, when I talk about data, I know it's a quite generic concept, but I'm talking about not only technologies that will help you streamline efforts to better understand customer insights, but also for you to be able to craft compelling stories when you develop a more comprehensive storytelling towards your clients, towards your peers, uh, towards convincing someone about something, you know. Being fact-based, developing a data-driven approach is key. And this means you really should be and feel free to learn a technology, learn a code, uh, learn to understand if not, if you don't think you're technically savvy. And again, I'm not considered myself a technical 
uh, hardcore developer, but I need to understand what data means and what's that what's data's importance to the business and how can I uh, leverage on it to get uh, better insights to make better and more sound decisions. The second uh, set of skills or capabilities that I want to share with you is uh, leverage networks. And this speaks a lot about not only developing networks, but also uh, using current ones to achieve organizational and, of course, personal or individual goals. And uh, I'm sure that a lot of you uh, participate and are members of different uh, networks, more professional job-related ones, but also that you do have your group of friends, family, and acquaintances. It's critical to use networks and to develop and streamline the use of networks, not only to gain better insights, perspectives on feedback around how can we uh, sort out or engage better solutions to uh, problems, but also being able to influence and be influenced positively, especially uh, when we really think about the power of hearing other people out. And, you know, networks can be really, really strong, especially if we are able to build them around thought leaders or people that will definitely add a lot of value with their opinions, with their perspective, with their uh, thought leadership uh, nuances. And uh, at some point, if we have the opportunity to build relationships, to thrive and to leverage our knowledge and to add our 1%, that'd be awesome. So I really encourage you to uh, develop uh, a stronger presence on, on, on networks, whether if it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, you know, as much as you uh, really think that you can get a professional insight or maybe personal insights that will leverage and help you be a better professional, uh, you're really gaining a lot. And of course, developing a, a robust uh, and also versatile profile that can really be adaptable to different networks because a lot of people uh, get close to job opportunities to uh, new ventures and uh, a lot of uh, contacts can be developed through uh, leveraging networks. So I really uh, encourage you to actually be bold, brave, and don't be shy to reach out people uh, because you never know what can happen. The third uh, capability that I wanna share has to do with think and act global. So benchmarking global best practices and bringing them to your organization. So local, global, local, we really need to start, and this is quite aligned to what I mentioned a while ago, uh, to develop uh, an outside-in perspective. Because at some point, uh, we need to understand what others are doing, and this speaks about competitors in the same industry or even the best players in different industries. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, rankings that can actually help. You know, you have uh, the Fortune rankings, the American Customer Satisfaction Index rankings, European Customer Satisfaction Index rankings are the best place to work rankings. There are thousands of them that actually bring a lot of good stuff and a lot of thought leadership uh, publications. And uh, this will definitely help you understand in the, what type of industry or what type of things would you be keen on doing or experiencing with a, an innovative fashion. Uh, and of course, uh, always uh, thinking that uh, in order for an organization to thrive, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about a small or medium enterprise, a startup, or a corporation, uh, developing a global perspective that incorporates not only local but regional components will be definitely key, especially when we think about the medium to the long term. And definitely learning how to navigate culturally complex and nuanced business situations is something that uh, we can definitely thrive if we understand and we listen to cautionary tales to uh, success stories and of course to failure stories because there's a lot of uh, knowledge that we can leverage if we hear how companies failed and what did they do uh, so we can do different. And uh, I really encourage you to have a look at that and to have that uh, perspective. The fourth uh, capability that I wanna share with you is uh, inspire engagement. And this speaks about fostering from your own place and it doesn't matter if you're an analyst, a manager, or C-suite uh, executive, to foster a culture that uh, creates meaningful connections between the workforce and uh, organizational values. Uh, and the best thing that we can do to start 
even again, if we're in a leadership position or if we are not in a leadership position, is to understand what we need as individuals and what we need to grow and uh, to ask ourselves if the organization is actually allowing us to do that, uh, especially at times like this where, you know, new jobs are uh, being developed, other jobs are being destroyed, new ventures are created every day. Uh, and uh, at some point, we as the workforce have uh, a great opportunity to select what type of projects do we want to execute, uh, what are the assignments that we want to pursue. And uh, a great question around this, and maybe speaking about Gen X, Gen Z, millennials, you know, it's really important that we commit to projects that we really want to participate on, that are aligned with our values, and that, of course, can uh, create uh, value to our society. And this speaks a lot about engagement from a inclusivity from an inclusivity perspective. Uh, I think that a lot of organizations uh, speak about diversity, equity, and inclusion or day. Uh, some of them really mean it because they practice it. And some of them actually see this as a way of, you know, enhancing the reputation. In either way, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is pivotal as well as developing psychological safety. This is giving people the opportunity to speak up, say what they think, be respect for it, and uh, of course, allow them to be empowered to take risks and uh, make sure that they are. Uh, I strongly believe that collaboration speaks a lot about psychological safety and the best organizations, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about high tech or consulting or retail or a public sector company, uh, need to embrace this as a way of growing and thriving. Because at some point, uh, organizations are their people. And uh, if we cannot give them a space to be comfortable and to speak up, even if they are uncomfortable or if they want to improve something, then uh, we won't be able to actually grow individually and collectively. So this speaks also about developing and inspiring engagements through meaning meaningful conversations. A lot of organizations uh, develop uh, systems where they have everyone has a coach uh, a mentor or someone to look upon and this speaks from admin stuff to developing performance management with use or even helping them uh, shape their career what do they want to do how do they see themselves in the next couple of years and uh, if there's anything that uh, these mentors these coaches can actually do it's great that uh, people can leverage on it i've been a coach i've been a mentor and i actually really enjoy the opportunity to have and develop great conversations with people, even if I don't know their backgrounds or if I feel that I cannot contribute from a technical perspective. I do think that sharing experience is critical because it's also a way for me and for coaches or mentors to also learn. And uh, again, inspiring engagement is all about learning, is all about putting yourself in other people's shoes. Uh, this specifically speaks all about being or feeling vulnerable to ask someone for help, uh, advice, and of course, trying to develop uh, good feedback, you know, and uh, providing and receiving feedback is critical, not only for inspiring engagement, but to make sure that everyone really feels heard. Uh, I, I really remember a lot of occasions where, again, uh, I provided feedback to my uh, peers, to my teams, and even I received feedback from my managers or partners, or even my own teammates. And at some point, you know, over time, you really uh, learn to understand that feedback nurtures you and allows you to grow. If you take it personal uh, in the wrong way, then you won't be making any justice to it. But at some point, you need to understand that behind every piece of feedback, there's an invaluable lesson. And this speaks about your ability to be resilient and even to learn how to like to hear things that you do not agree. Because at some point, to inspire engagement, the best thing to do it is to acknowledge that you don't need to agree with everything, with everyone. And as uh, crude as this might sound, you don't need to be liked by everyone. So as leaders, as uh, colleagues, as teammates, as individual contributors, we can definitely inspire engagement. 
and we can actually develop juicy insights that can help everyone. Fifth capability. Uh, this is quite interesting and uh, I really enjoy talking about this, especially because I think that we are, and I myself, uh, am in the process of refreshing and uh, revamping my communication every time that I can. So communicate strategically. It's really hard to communicate, uh, I should say, and uh, even when you want to address different audiences uh, from a class, from a stakeholder management meeting, uh, from a client uh, management perspective. So you really need to develop crisp and clear messaging, which again, believe me, it's really hard, especially if you need to craft it to each specific audience, to each specific industry, to each specific nuance that can actually happen. So developing crisp and clear messaging, as well as adapting it to different audiences is tough and it takes time. So at some point, it's critical that you learn and you have the ability to craft your own communication style and to adapt it to different circumstances. You cannot be the same person when addressing a family member, friend, client, an audience where you're actually speaking to. I mean, you are the same individual, but the tone, the way, the strategy that you use to uh, develop and transmit a compelling message is never the same. And that's one of the best things about learning, teaching, and developing your own style and strategy. So in order to find your own voice, you need to practice, 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 practice. Be bold. Uh, a lot of people say that the best way of learning is to teach. I do believe that's a really great uh, truth, especially when you start at a young age uh, and uh, when you have the opportunity to take risks in a safe environment. Um, so finding your own voice, understanding who you are and what's your style is something that changes all over time. I'm not the same person when I started teaching at age 22 that I am now actually. And uh, I had the opportunity to work and learn from a lot of great mentors and uh, be in front of a lot of different audiences. Uh, and again, that helped me craft my own storytelling and of course, uh, leverage on different didactic or maybe less didactic uh, approaches and techniques. Um, I've been uh, also working a lot of, uh, a lot on uh, developing a data-centric and fact-based approach, especially when I do consulting. Because when you speak with any type of audience, you really want to share uh, facts, things that are crisp and clear and speak about how people feel, how clients feel. This presentation has some of that. This presentation has some of experience and a lot of a qualitative uh, own learnings. So at some point, it's critical that we can also collaborate, not only by sharing our experience, but through the right channels. So I'm sure that a lot of you know uh, different collaboration tools, just mentioning uh, a couple of them, Slack, Miro, Asana, even when you think about uh, Microsoft Teams or any uh, messaging platform to share data feeds, uh, even LinkedIn uh, that has, of course, a one-on-one -on -one messaging uh, functionality. And uh, also it's critical to practice, 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 and ask for feedback as much as you can. Uh, again, uh, the value of feedback is amazing. Amazing, and people think that the only uh, perspective that they want to hear is positive. But you know, it's great to be able to enjoy uh, a respectful, professional message that helps you grow and improve. Um, the sixth capability deals uh, with fostering innovation, and uh, you know, innovation is a pivotal concept. We've heard of it uh, through Clay Christensen. Uh, again, I really recommend uh, The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, a pivotal strategy uh, book. But innovation is a very big concept if we can't adapt it to a specific industry, to a specific context. Um, and each organization has or should have their own innovation processes, their own creative uh, way of doing things. So fostering innovation, I think we can all uh, add our two cents to the discussion. 
And uh, a great uh, thing that I've seen from, from clients that I work with is to develop and or enhance structures that can actually best support innovation, whether it is through the use of technology or through the use of, of forums or through the use of outing sessions or through the use of think tanks or design thinking or any technique that can help them or that can help us uh, thrive and share uh, ideas that we at some point wouldn't think of. So at some point, having those processes refreshed and documented is critical. And having, of course, systems that uh, promote them is also key because when we think about uh, high-tech companies such as Google, Globant, even Mercado Libre, which is a Latin American uh, e-commerce unicorn, uh, when we think about Tesla, when we think about uh, Walmart, they all are innovating in different ways and in different fashions. And uh, those processes are reiterated each and every time. So I definitely encourage you uh, to discover that. And uh, one other thing that I, I, I really believe that is critical to develop, and this is a process, it, this is not from one day to the other, is to, stri is to strive for developing a growth mindset uh, approach. Again, growth mindset is a concept that was defined by Carol Dweck, uh, an organizational psychologist. And again, this speaks a lot about the importance of uh, developing a broad view around uh, problem solving, uh, around ways of better enhancing how can we approach uh, different situations, trying to think broadly, trying to get as much input as possible, trying to think the opposite as a fixed mindset, trying to listen and hear and get as much feedback as we can in order to enhance and uh, expand our perspective and our view. And that is what actually helped our brains uh, think in a more creative way, you know? Uh, and again, when I, when I also share this uh, notion about trying to be as, as much as tech savvy as possible, again, I, I would never recommend for everyone to become a technical or a software developer. Like that's the opposite thing that I want to transmit. Being tech savvy means learning to embrace the technology so that when you're uh, sharing uh, thought leadership or when you're participating on a project as an individual contributor or as a team leader, you're able to speak the same language, you're able to understand, you're able to think the way that people approach. And uh, this will also allow you to share uh, a common jargon, a common way of uh, transmitting and communicating ideas. So again, two more to go. Uh, the seventh one is to cultivate a learning agility. And again, we are, and I believe in, in the lifelong learning uh, concept. And uh, I myself try to learn something new, if not every day, every week, every month. Uh, if we can develop this lifelong learning mindset, if we can be eternal learners, uh, we'll definitely be in, on the right track to be able to be more resilient and adapt to different realities and notions. Um, I always uh, recommend people to assist webinars uh, that are in their interest zone uh, or maybe outside their comfort zone to enroll in different events uh, on site remotely to do a, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, massive online open courses that are free and a lot of certifications that actually stimulate and of course uh, enhance brain power. Uh, so again, I would be really keen on, on sharing this, uh, if you want to connect, uh, one-on-one -on -one or if you want any insight, but there's like a lot of free stuff and content that needs to be curated and that needs to be accessed. And this helps a lot to, uh, enhance your own problem solving skills, which is critical. And, uh, I always also recommend, and as I've mentioned it before, to review successful and unsuccessful case studies. Uh, you learn a lot from failure, uh, from own failure and from others, other people's. Uh, and that's uh, critical to cultivating a learning agility and to making sure that we can uh, see it through uh, in a creative and uh, maybe a different way. And uh, the final one that I wanna share and this again, it's not exhaustive, but this is what I can actually rescue from my my time uh, in, in, in different industries doing consulting to develop personal adaptability. adaptability. And uh, again, 
uh, remaining focused uh, and, of course, uh, trying to be uh, effective and as solid as possible, especially when facing uncertainty. This is what we cannot control because, of course, uh, we need to uh, navigate uh, a lot of uh, different landscapes where we think we know something and we actually don't. And uh, it's even harder when we don't know what, what we don't know. And <laughs> this speaks a lot about, uh, you know, uh, confronting chaos and being able to handling it in the best way possible. So I would suggest trying to be as flexible as possible uh, with changing situations and environments. Uh, it's easy to frustrate if we uh, really feel that we are doing a lot of things and we can't get results. And I live that reality every day because, you know, nobody's perfect. And uh, we really want to think in terms of cultivating this learning agility and personal ad adaptability at the same time. So uh, talking about building resilience, uh, making ourselves more stronger uh, when we effectively face problems. Managing stress is really hard, uh, especially if we deal with a lot of things at the same time, you know, work pressures, family pressures, uh, being in other countries, uh, you name it. Uh, but it's important that we can also uh, learn how to put our best and be passionate and love what we do uh, if we want to really thrive and uh, develop this personal adaptability. Because in this uh, in this notion, uh, acknowledging that uh, sometimes we are wrong or that sometimes we don't feel good is also good. <laughs> it's also necessary. So I, I definitely think that recognizing uh, that not all past approaches can work uh, even if they were successful in previous occasions. I really don't believe in the one-size-fits-all approach and uh, in plug-and-play models that uh, are there just to use. I do believe adaptability uh, is critical and necessary. And of course, learning and capitalizing from mistakes, again, and it's probably the third or fourth time that I mentioned this, is also pivotal. So just some final thoughts uh, that I want to share. Try to improve uh, each and every day a bit. And of course, aligning expectations with yourself, with your family and friends, with your clients. It's critical for you to be successful and to thrive in whatever venture you're doing. Uh, be as agile as possible. Again, whether it's for a business venture or for a personal uh, nuance, try to stay focused and uh, also try to be as kind as possible. Kindness is invaluable. Not only when you really need to share and uh, face issues, but when you speak to people, you, to your family, to your friends, human kindness, you know, is definitely, definitely critical. Invest in good, in good people. Uh, that is, if you're a leader, if you're a manager, if you are developing teams, invest on them. And uh, try to also invest in yourself uh, and surround yourself with great talent, with great people, with great leaders. Try to build this robust network uh, and again, it doesn't matter if it's through a social network or if it's through meetings or, you know, everyone has their own ways. Uh, mindset change, uh, again, it's constant. And developing this growth mindset will be critical, uh, especially if you have a fixed mindset, especially if you're pretty close to an, one or two ways of doing things. There are definitely more and uh, probably more efficient. So you just need to be open to it, at least to acknowledge the fact that they exist. Uh, leadership and innovation are two phases of the same coin. Uh, so to innovate is to dare, not to innovate might be lethal and might lead to your death. Not your death. I mean, your venture, your uh, entrepreneurial, uh, uh, your entrepreneurial efforts. Uh, it's critical to embrace and to take risks. So new roles will emerge. Uh, some old ones will perish. You need to be ready to transform yourself to risk skill and to upskill constantly. Hack your current workplace, uh, even if you do hybrid, remote, or on-site, you know, uh, try to make the best and enjoy the experience. I always try to think in terms of do what you love and, let, and love what you do. And not everyone can love what they do because maybe they haven't found it yet or they don't know what is, uh, because again, they didn't have the opportunity to, you know, do something that they love. And a lot of people actually, do what they love, are passionate about their roles, their professions, and that is contagious. So don't be afraid of technology. Uh, and, uh, you know, don't freak out when things go wrong. We are always learning. I would say fail fast and improve faster. Uh, be courageous, brave, 
try to work collaboratively, you know, the results of teamwork. I want to think teamwork equals dream work. And, uh, you know, not everyone has the opportunity to work with people that they actually admire or that they actually love to do that. So <laughs> better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And this is quite bold because not every organization shares this approach. But if you have a great idea, if you have a good uh, intention, if you really want to help your business or your group or your team thrive, uh, you know, share your perspective and don't be afraid to speak up. And also don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't panic nor paralyze. You know, we are human beings. We don't know everything. Uh, actually, we know less than we think and uh, we can cherish and nourish ourselves from other people. And uh, as a bonus, avoid unnecessary stress. Try to be happy and enjoy yourself. So uh, just a small plus for books that are really nice to, you know, know that they exist. So we can at least read a summary. Uh, Thomas uh, Chamorro for music from uh, Manpower and uh, Harvard uh, just uh, developed High Human. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, it speaks about the impact that disruptive technology is having in the workplace. Uh, then the digital mindset uh, by Paul Lenardi and C. Del Neely, again, from Harvard. Uh, they are amazing, uh, trying to explain how we should uh, refocus and uh, refresh our way of thinking and problem solving using and leveraging on technology. Amy Edmondson's right kind of wrong, again, speaking a lot about psychological safety and the science of failing well. And then uh, Frey and Morris, Move Fast and Fix Things. They also have a podcast that's a delight to hear. Um, which again, I, I believe that uh, can benefit uh, everyone, uh, especially in this time. So again, I really wanna thank you and uh, encourage you to at some point uh, be bold. And uh, I'm here for any questions. I really enjoyed uh, this experience and I really hope you had enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much, Alan. It was really, really interesting. Like your last 10 things to, to do with like a manifesto. We should have printed out in our offices as well, I suppose. Very interesting. There are actually five questions for you. So I'm gonna read them aloud so that you can maybe take time to answer. Um, there is the first one from Leonardo. What role uh, does AI play in optimizing workforce management to accommodate a four-day work week while maintaining salary levels? This is a great one, Leonardo. And uh, to be honest, uh, working in consulting and uh, you know dealing a lot with client issues uh, also allows me to say that it's not an easy task. And uh, I do think AI if properly trained, can help us optimize scheduling. But at some point, AI cannot avoid clients calling us and telling us, we need your help, we need your perspective, this is urgent. So, you know, at some point, this is quite sensitive because as consultants, I would say we are doctors to organizations. And a doctor, you know, if you like are literally dying or if you have a pain, mm. you need to help. Uh, so at some point, I do think AI from a tool perspective can definitely help optimizing efforts in terms of scheduling uh, and maybe for more transactional and routine work. But it could be challenging to do it if we're facing with different clients in different parts of the world and with different uh, notions. And again, I do think that, of course, four-day work with weeks can be accommodated, but there's going to be a cost around it, especially if we want to uh, or if we need to work more and compress our week. So it's not about the amount of hours you'll be working. It's about what you can actually do and the value you can add in those hours. And again, that it's more up to us rather than, than uh, what AI can do. AI can definitely help in the process and share a lot of insights and even help us thrive. But uh, this is a tricky one. And there's a lot of uh, nuances that at some point prevent a lot of organizations to say, okay, you know what? We'll give people uh, three day weekends and, you know, if clients appear, oh yeah, you're out of office because again, clients and organizations actually don't sleep. So again, thank you for, for that. Okay. Thanks for that the answer as well. Then we have a question from Diego, which soft skills do you believe will become most valuable in the age of AI and why are they critical for future career success? This is a great one, Diego. Um, I think there's a combination of uh, hard and soft skills that need to be developed from a hardcore perspective. I would say 
try to think in terms of a business architect, try to position yourself between the tech space and the business. Uh, when I think about a business architect role, it's a, a hybrid role. You need to know from a business perspective what to do, but you also need to understand technical jargon and to be able to execute on it. That's why I really recommend, you know, uh, develop your data savviness, uh, work around understanding data visualization, uh, crack a couple of online courses on Power BI or any data visualization tool. Uh, use DataCamp. I love DataCamp. Uh, it's it's great uh, if you want crisp and clear, uh, you know, short courses that allows you to work and practice a lot on a console. Um, and uh, I also think that from a soft skills perspective, uh, being able to uh, listen more than speaking, being resilient, helping people thrive and helping them grow, developing your own coaching and uh, leadership style will be critical. Um, and daring to be bold and taking risks, which is very underrated, especially considering that not every organization actually allows you to do that. Again, this is just uh, what comes to mind from my experience. And I think that, you know, in the age of AI, it's not about being a master in handling the technical technology, but understanding how can you best use it to your personal benefit from a development perspective and how can you use it to enhance the work that you do with your teams. Okay, since you men mentioned coaching as well, um, I'm going to the question of Roberta now that she asked, how can companies effectively leverage AI to democratize access to coaching across their workflows while ensuring fair and unbiased outcomes? So <laughs> this is a good one because mm -hmm. to, to be honest with you, uh, Roberta, it's uh, kind of hard to think in terms of using AI to coach when coaching is so artisanal, so uh, heartfelt based, so personal. So you can use technology and in this case, AI to uh, help you craft uh, great advice, but the best advice comes from your own experience. Uh, and this means you have, le you have lived situations, you have lived uh, you know, projects and nuances that are unique to you. And the greatest value in this, when you coach, when you mentor, and again, coaching and mentoring are different things. I don't want to use them as the same like way. Uh, simplifying it, you know, when you help people thrive, when you help people grow, you're growing as well. So the best way to, at some point, uh, leverage technology is to think of it as a tool, but it's just 20% of the equation. The 80% is what comes from your heart, from your experience, from your willingness to help people. And at some point, that is the best way to provide unbiased advice. Unbiased in the sense that, you know, it's tough because when you share your experience, there's a bias component because you lived it in a certain way. But you can also try to extract what you learned from that that can be adapted by the coachee when uh, confronting a problem. Hope I answered yeah, that's a very fascinating, actually, um, topic, the coaching and AI. <laughs> Thank you for that. And then we have a question from Daria. How can educational institution businesses prepare students, individuals, to develop the essential skills for the future workforce <laughs> alongside AI? Yeah. Well, the first answer is, you know, enroll it, open. It. It's the greatest <laughs> way to, to, to see results uh, lively. Uh, and and again, uh, it, it it was a great uh, it was a great link to to what we are actually doing here. But I do believe that uh, educational uh, institutions at an undergrad and grad level should should and are actually incorporating a lot uh, this uh, skills that are required, especially in these times of uh, the fourth industrial revolution, the era of information, the era of disruptive tech. Again. Uh, you know, uh, at school, even when we think about, uh, you know, uh, senior kindergarten, you know, to, to, to the first graders, uh, some institutions are uh, working with their uh, students to learn to like help them and uh, to teach them how to code or the, the foundations of, you know, uh, what can they do with data. And uh, post-secondary institutions are doing their work and their job 
uh, leveraging and understanding that, uh, you know, careers, undergrad and grad, uh, need to have these skills as part of the whole curriculum. One course, two courses are not enough. You cannot learn uh, in a couple of courses. You need, you, and of course, the, the best way to approaching this, I believe, is uh, to take risks and, of course, to curate and refresh a lot of stuff uh, that it's out there. You know, uh, a lot of uh, free courses, webinars, webcasts, uh, a lot of material out there. Again, I, I really um, also uh, encourage you if you want to connect with me uh, so we can exchange more. But yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. And also another like... Uh... <laughs> Spectator said, thank you for the insightful presentation and the book recommendations. Yeah, that was very good. Okay. Okay, so thank you so much for all your time here. It was really insightful, very interesting. I think we're going to use a lot of your advices. So thank you for that. And as Professor Alan said, like if you want to know more, you can connect with them on LinkedIn. And you can actually also enroll in one of our courses and have him as a professor. <laughs> okay. So it's thank you. Pleasure. I know that you have to go. Uh, so I will just continue and finish off my presentation with few information about OPIT. And thank you. Thanks again. So thank allow you, me. Thanks. Allow me to uh, like. Okay. So I'm going to just share my screen and just say a few words about um, OPIT and our programs in 2024. Um, so in September 2024, we're going to have four master. Uh, sorry. Yes, four master of science and two bachelors. Uh, bachelor in modern computer science and in digital business, and master of science in applied data science and AI, enterprise cybersecurity, digital business and innovation, and responsible uh, artificial intelligence. Um, the structure of the two bachelors are pretty similar. They run over six terms that can be done in two years or three years with the fast track or the regular track. At the beginning, you have the core terms where the foundation are like applied, and then you have the electives. And finally, you finish off with a dissertation that can become as well an internship in a company. So the foundations of computer science are about uh, what is computer science, how to apply the most important uh, parts of computer science to cybersecurity, data science, uh, metaverse and gaming, cloud computing. Those are the streams that you can do in the elective parts. And the careers, of course, are about becoming a software developer, a data scientist, a web developer, uh, application and game developer, cybersecurity analyst, and everything that is concerned and con around computer science. The Bachelor in Digital Business um, as a foundation that is still about computer science, so you will learn IT skills alongside the business insights uh, and the digital expertise that is required to apply to digital organization as well. So something that we talk about tonight is very important. So both the foundations in economics and digital business with robust IT skills are fundamental nowadays in any organization. And the careers are more on the digital aspects, so digital business consultant, digital marketing specialist or product specialist, IT business analyst, and so on and so forth. The Master of Sciences and degrees are four. Um, they all can be done over three terms for 90 credits, ECTS, or for four terms for 120 credits. Uh, so you can enjoy the length of the dissertation and have a longer experience or a shorter one. Uh, it is up to you. Uh, the first one, the Master of Science in Applied Data Science and AI, it's more mostly about application of AI and data science to uh, to the different type of sectors in business and to develop a critical thinking. So it is at the intersection between management and tech. And the careers are mostly about becoming a data analytics consultant, a scientist, or an AI consultant. The MSc in Enterprise Cybersecurity is um, focused vertically on cybersecurity, so on corporate strategy, practical skills to develop strategies to become one of the blue or red team as the cybersecurity is. Uh, usually say about themselves, and it's aligned with official industry certification. So you can have a career in uh, uh, to become a CISO, a cybersecurity consultant, an IT manager, or a cybersecurity compliance officer, everything within that um, uh, the cybersecurity sector. Um, regarding the digital business and innovation, this is a very interesting program. It's a blend between the theory and practical expertise to leverage on what is um, between technology, digitaliz digitalization, and business. So you will uh, learn a lot about 
digital business again on a higher level and you can become a business consultant or a digital entrepreneur an innovation manager or digital marketing manager so it's a blend again between digitalization and business and finally the mastering of responsible artificial intelligence is the most technical one it's advanced technical concepts in ai within the responsibility that is aligned in the eu ai act so you will learn about ai the the technical proficiency of it, the ethical responsibility of making some certain choices, and to become an AI developer or product manager, designer, business strategist, or a machine learning engineer. Um, the class experience is very much the same for all the courses, so you will have live lessons and recorded content, 50-50. Live lessons are not mandatory, and they're based on a competence-based methodology. That means that you will not have final exam, oral exam, but progressive assessment. So you will learn the, the competence and move on. Um, and the, our courses, whenever possible, are aligned with professional certifications so that you can take them outside of the degree. And students have the support of tutors, of the career service, of the professors, of the coordinator as well. Finally, you have the fast and regular track option that I mentioned before. So you can finish the bachelor in two years instead of three and the master of science in one year instead of one year and a half. The learning experience is very smooth. We have a platform, Canvas Learning Management System, where you can find everything you need. So you have your courses, the lesson recorded already there if you, if you missed one, um, all your grades, all the collaborative material that you can uh, need to just work with your classmates, the forum where to discuss things with professors, the tutors to, uh, to be approached in case you need anything, the certification that you will need, anything that is requires your attendance or your like experience is within this platform that is also available on your mobile phone. To apply, um, it's quite straightforward. We have an application online. You use the Apply Now button on our website, fill out the application, upload your documents, so CV and document, admission documents, and then you will actually join for us for an interview, a motivational interview. And finally, if everything is fine in September, you can join and start with and start your journey. What do we require? For the bachelor degree, we require a high school certificate. Um, and a B2 level certificate of English. And for the Master of Science, we require an undergraduate degree, according to the different like uh, programs, there are different type of degrees that we accept, and a B2 level certificate or equivalent. What is very important that um, we accept, um, we actually evaluate previous study, if you studied at another university, and previous work experience in order to transfer your credits. It's part of the process of the admissions as well. Regarding the fees, um, both programs, they cost 2,250 euros per term. The bachelor runs over six terms, the master over three terms, or four, if you do go for the 120 credits. And if you pay in advance, you have a 10% discount in both uh, situations, and we have scholarships up to 40%. If you have any questions or would like to know more, please do not hesitate to contact us, to contact our students. You can find them on our website, on LinkedIn. So here we have Angela from the US, Antonio from Italy, Alona from the UK, Mohammed from Iraq, Anthony from Cyprus, etc. So people from Brazil, from Africa, from Europe, from everywhere in the world. You can find a lot of testimonials on our website. And if you want to talk to one of our students, please do not hesitate to contact us. Finally, we have two presentations coming up, a masterclass on Friday, July 19th. Uh, this is an open class, so students of OPIT, um, the class will be open to students currently enrolled at OPIT, but also to anyone who wants to join. It's at 12 uh, Central European time, and it's with a guest speaker, Chandan Akpal, a leading expert in the field of surviving and thriving a new model for the new disruptive era. So it's something again about AI, something again about digital technology, something about how can we survive in this in industrial revolution that is completely ch ch changing the way we live and work. And finally, next week, we're going to have a presentation about uh, our programs, our platform, how to apply the support that you get with uh, the OP team. So myself and other colleagues will actually give you some uh, insightful information about everything you should know in order to apply and start your journey with us. 
You can contact us in the meantime. You can write to us at hello at opi.com. You can actually write us, uh, to us on WhatsApp. Here there is the QR code. You can call us. Uh, there is the phone number. Or just visit our website for more information, download the brochure, or just use the, the form in order to contact us. Okay, so thank you very much, of your everybody, for your time. This presentation will be uploaded on YouTube and sent to us. And in case you want to contact with Professor Alan Lerner, just let us know in case you need some information about our courses. We are here to answer you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a lovely day or night or <laughs> afternoon, wherever you are.